Staff Sergeant David G. Bellavia distinguished himself by acts of gallantry, intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty on November 10, 2004, while serving as a squad leader in support of Operation Phantom Fury in Fallujah, Iraq. While clearing a house, a squad from Staff Sergeant Bellavia's platoon became trapped within a room by intense enemy fire coming from a fortified position under the stairs leading to the second floor. Recognizing the immediate severity of the situation and with disregard for his own safety, Staff Sergeant Bellavia retrieved an automatic weapon and entered the doorway of the house to engage the insurgents. With enemy rounds impacting around him, Staff Sergeant Bellavia fired at the enemy position at a cyclic rate, providing covering fire that allowed the squad to break contact and exit the house. A Bradley firing vehicle was brought forward to suppress the enemy. However, due to the high wall surrounding the house, it could not fire directly at the enemy position. Staff Sergeant Bellavia then re-entered the house and again came under intense enemy fire. He observed an enemy insurgent preparing to launch a rocket-propelled grenade at his platoon. Recognizing the grave danger the grenade posed to his fellow soldiers, Staff Sergeant Bellavia assaulted the enemy position, killing one insurgent and wounding another who ran to a different part of the house. Staff Sergeant Bellavia, realizing he had an unclear, darkened room to his back, moved to clear it. As he entered, an insurgent came down the stairs firing at him. Simultaneously, the previously wounded insurgent reemerged and engaged Staff Sergeant Bellavia. Staff Sergeant Bellavia, entering further into the darkened room, returned fire and eliminated both insurgents. Staff Sergeant Bellavia then received enemy fire from another insurgent emerging from a closet in the darkened room. Exchanging gunfire, Staff Sergeant Bellavia pursued the enemy upstairs and eliminated him. Now on the second floor, Staff Sergeant Bellavia moved to a door that had opened onto the roof. At this point, a fifth insurgent leapt from the third floor and onto the second floor roof. Staff Sergeant Bellavia engaged the insurgent through the window, wounding him in the back and legs, and caused him to fall onto the roof. Acting on instinct to save the members of his platoon from an immediate threat, Staff Sergeant Bellavia ultimately cleared the entire enemy-filled house, destroying four insurgents and badly wounding a fifth. Staff Sergeant Bellavia's bravery and complete disregard for his own safety and selfish and courageous actions are in keeping with the finest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself and the United States. <clears throat> From the halls no, of no, 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 okay. Don't look at the, the don't look at the thing. Don't look. I'm not. Okay. Okay. We will fight our country's battles in the air on land and sea. First to fight for rights and freedoms and to keep our honor clean. Do, 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 do. We are proud to claim the title of United States Marines. Our flags unfurled oh my God, to verse. the breeze from dawn to setting sun. We have fought in every climb and place where you can tote a gun. Where we do. could take a gun. Close up. In the snow of far off northern lands and in sunny tropic scenes. You will find us always on the job, the United States Marines. Woohoo! It is Here's the Marine Corps. Here's to oh, here you we go. and to our Corps, which we are proud to serve. In many a strife we fought for life and never lost our nerve. If the Army and the Navy ever look on heaven scenes, they're a bunch of losers. They will find the streets are guarded by United States Marines. Air Force wasn't even included because they're lame. True, <laughs> true, true, true. There we Excellent go. Excellent work, Kate. That was Woo. the least stolen valor, Katie, thing that you've done in months. Does I anyone love else it. have a bone doggy right now? I've got a I huge, am no, rock I've got a medium hard. sized bone doggy. I, I am wanna, rock I hard. Lie. Are you? Well, wow, that's no, that's impressive. No. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we do have a great show for you today. It's not just going to be Marine centric. I promise. No, we're, no. We have we probably lost every listener that started. I mean, that no, was very annoying. It. No, I doubt it. People love your voice. They love okay. your singing voice. Okay. I've, actually, some of the comments on iTunes have been like, Kate needs to sing more. So I'm glad that we're actually doing that for the listener. Okay. That's I was nice. going to do a little more pussy popping during that version, but I thought. 
Yeah, I think that's one thing ZBT has always needed is more puss. Like, yeah. I think that's been a mm -hmm. common theme. The military the as show. a whole, if you ask yeah. me. Yeah, more puss is good. Like, I, most, I think men and women agree that that's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. 100%. Was it in A Few Good Men where they say, oh, they're eight up, and they're eight up about what? Eight up about being Marines? Was the that Marines that at movie? Guantanamo Bay are fanatical. Yes. Fanatical about fanatical. what? About being yeah. Marines. Yeah. Yeah. Damn yeah, right. yeah. That's 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 what that opening made me think of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm eight they up are. about being And there's been a lot of haters going on on the internets about from different branches of service about the Marine Corps birthday and like, oh, you guys have to talk about your Mar sorry you guys aren't proud. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. Sorry you don't celebrate yourselves like we do. Because we have sorry. a reason to celebrate. Every Bella Marine you Wood ever heard of your it, birthday. Bitch? I asked some soldiers. They're like, we have no the idea. The only reason, the only reason you guys all know is because it coincides with Veterans Iwo Day. It's Jima, like a built-in cheat sheet. We have a birthday ball. We talk about it all the time. We have a big ball every year. It's no, but I bet no. You know Marines, what? Ninety-five percent of Marines do not give a fuck about Veterans Day. It is. Do all you about know the Marine, the Marine Corps birthday. birthday? Do you know what the Marines are? Do you know what the Marines are? The Marines are the obnoxious girl who celebrates her birthday weekend. You can't and talk about this month. when you go to West what? Point She's cons. Fun as if you're fun. a West Point yeah, guy, yeah. you have okay. no right. Yeah. You're wearing your fucking shirt right now. You're just as yeah. ate up about that. I mean, that's, 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 no, that's different. Oh, that's okay. That's, that's Good for silent, me, not for subtle. Z. Classic cons. It's silent. Classic it's silent. It's behavior. subtle. I got to tell wow. you, too, the Marine, we've done a bunch of stuff with the Flyers Warriors hockey team. Um, there's warrior hockey teams across the country. If you're a veteran, man, woman, whatever, it doesn't matter. They want you to come learn how to play. Like, anyway. Like, no experience required. They're awesome. So we've done a bunch of stuff with the Philly Warrior team. It's all disabled vets. Um, and they're doing their birthday party at Barstool's Sansom Street Philly Bar Thursday night. Like, as you're listening to this. And they asked if I would come read the birthday message. And I can. I have something here at work till late. And then whatever. But I'm like. this? Like how you're supposed to? Yeah, I would hold the scroll. <laughs> I was like, fuck, I've always wanted to do that. Next year, next year. The 13th Commandant of the Marine Corps, John A. LeJarn. <laughs> <laughs> but I do just have like fuck. I have FOMO. I want to do a Marine Corps birthday party. That sounds awesome. I'm jealous. It's sweet. Well, um, we should have some cake whenever we go down there on Friday. A little yeah, bit of we'll cake. Yeah, we'll do a little cake. We'll have, I'll bring we, a cake into the. Why office. don't me and you have a, bir a Marine Corps birthday party on the bus down to the Barstool Invitation? Oh, everyone will love that. They will love it. People you know what? I just it. thought of. That'd be like the the meme where the guys just standing in the corner and everybody else is at the party and you it's just you two in the they corner. Don't like, know it's they the don't even know it's thing. the Marines. Birthday. Oh, they're gonna know because we're gonna tell them. Like <laughs> yeah. they're definitely gonna know, and they're also gonna know that we have three rounds of the magazine today. Round number one, we have Medal of Honor recipient David Bellavia, who came on the show, and I gotta say, like sometimes I we're so far removed from the military that we don't. I, a lot of times I don't have those same type of conversations. Talking to somebody who has been in the same exact area, although it was at a different time, same exact area as I was, it's it's legitimately refreshing. Like to talk to somebody who has the same experiences as you. Mm. Obviously, not mine, not nearly to the same level as David, but to be in the same area, it does feel good. So sitting down with David and talking about how he received the Medal of Honor and what he did was motivating and i think that any leader worth his salt so listen to that it's all about caring about your people and loving your people and making sure that they know not just whenever you're in not just whenever you're in combat but all through the rest of your life like take care of your people that's his mantra and i think he's doing a great job that's the reason why he has this book remember the ramrods normally you know if i if i have somebody on the show that is an author i don't i don't suck their dick or fiddle their flaps whenever they come on the show to talk about that type of thing. This book is different. It has so much good conversation in it. You're going to love it. Round number two, it's Veterans Day. So let's remind some leaders that it's okay to lead your people with a little bit of compassion and some decency. And round number three, we're going to have a quick safety brief because it is going to be a long weekend for Marines and everybody else. Everybody else is going to get a 96 because it's the Marine Corps birthday. We're happy to do that for you guys. And all that is going to be brought to you by our good friends at Whistlepig. If you're at the ball, if you're at a Veterans Day party, if you're doing whatever you're doing, if you're going to the bar still invitation on, you need to have a little flask with something inside of it to make a little winter blanket that's going on because I think it's supposed to be like 45 degrees that night. Make sure that that flask is filled with nothing but Whistlepig. I don't care if you're getting the 100% rye or the 100 proof bourbon. You just need to make sure that you have Whistlepig in your cup wherever you're going. Always keep it at 100. Whistlepig matched their piggyback 100% rye with their piggyback bourbon rye is a little more spicy bourbon's a little bit more sweet we 
enjoy our cocktails that have a little bit of maple in it. They have piggyback rye that's 100% for a maple old fashioned. Those are delicious. 100% for all, all for 100. Piggyback 100% rye and piggyback 100% proof bourbon is 100% the good stuff. Get your bottle at shop.whistlepig.com or into our local retailer and buy them shits right then and there. I think Mm -hmm. that's what you need to do. And right now, we're going to go into round number one. We're going to kick off the show with David Bellavia. Here he is, Medal of Honor recipient and a great guy. Here he is. All right, so we got David here. I'm pumped to talk about it. And David, before we get going, I want to kind of set the scene of where I was at when you were conducting business in Fallujah. So in boot camp, one of the things, in Marine boot camp, one of the things that they do is tell you to, you have your history and you go through all the major battles that the Marines have fought in. And one of those was Sway City. And when your drill instructors would go out, they would say Battle of Way City. And you would scream back house to house. And it talked house to house and street to street. And it talked about it was in the Marine Corps ball message. And it was a huge battle for us. So when I got to my first unit in 2004, my sergeant set us down when we got there. And he was like, look, fellas. We have we have to train for actual war now. But and they told us what was going on in Fallujah. And that's exactly where you were. So your the Battle of Fallujah is when the war became real to me personally, that I knew that mm-hmm. I could end up there. Can you kind of give us the background of what Fallujah was like in 2004? Yeah, so the uh, so I was Army. You're a Marine. Uh, Ambar province was turned over in April of 04 from the 82nd Airborne to the, to the United States Marine Corps. So the Marine Corps had all of Ambar. And Ambar was always the place, even under Saddam, that was the most dangerous part of Iraq. Uh, there was a mindset that you took your guns to town in Fallujah. So the population of Fallujah built their homes like they were drug cartels. I mean, it was like designed for siege warfare. The, the homes are uh, defensible. Uh, gun slits uh, up uh, on the rooftop, thick walls. They were a very insecure population because of uh, just the, the nature of what Fallujah meant to the Iraqi people. And you've got the contractors that are attacked in late March of 04. Uh, the Marines start an operation in April called Vigilant Resolve, where they basically kick the hell out of the insurgents in Fallujah, but it's on camera. And because it's on camera, it becomes an IO, information operations, Americans are bad, uh, Marines are fighting a PR war. So the agreement is to pull out of Fallujah from April until to be announced. And during that time, there's a Fallujah brigade that turns and joins the enemy. They have our equipment, they have our weapons, they have our uniforms, and they've been unmolested from April until November. We got a big election, Kerry versus Bush. We're waiting for that election result. The United States Marine Corps with two army battalions is going to take out Fallujah Old Testament style. Mm. Men, It's a city the size of Tampa Bay, Florida. Uh, women and children have left. Zarqawi, unfortunately, left dressed as a woman uh, during that time. But this is where all those beheading videos that you saw in Iraq, yeah. That was happening in Fallujah. Zarqawi was in Fallujah. It was the headquarters of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And not having civilians there, unlike April of 04, this was a different type of fighting. Uh, They had time to prepare. Uh, We knew there were two to 4,000 bad guys. And for me, this was a generational fight. I got the Marines to my right shoulder, the Navy, the Air Force, the Army. Everyone is, is, is in this fight. Uh, It's the Super Bowl of urban battles for our generation. And what as a staff sergeant then, because you're an NCO then and you're in charge of a platoon, being a platoon sergeant and things like that. When you're there and you're doing you're hooking and jabbing, what's your main responsibility as a staff sergeant in the Army when you're in Fallujah? So so our ranks are a little bit different than yours, where the staff sergeant is a platoon sergeant Uh, in the Army. I was a squad leader, so I had 11 guys. And and my whole thing is that I was older. Uh, I looked at my role more of a surrogate father. You know, it's one thing to get these guys ready to go at the enemy. Uh, we we had cut our teeth in Diyala and, and all over Iraq by that point. We were in a 12-month deployment. We were at month nine. Our biggest concern is the psyche of our guys. Are you prepared for the close quarter battle? It's not 50 meters. 
It's not 35 meters. You're going to make eye contact. You're going to burn the enemy with our muzzle flashes. We're going to have to, to move forward and we're going to lose people. Mm -hmm. And that reality of we're expecting to lose people is something that's really difficult because no matter what happens, the hardest thing you have to do as, as, a, as a, a person in a close quarter battle is ignore the guy that's hurt. You have to ignore the guy that's wounded because if you don't get the guy who shot your buddy, you're all going to end up dead. And so that's a that's psychologically uh, a taxing on on nineteen year old kids, as you can imagine. And you were experienced a little, some combat because you had been in Kosovo before. But going in, I know for a, for me personally, whenever the rounds first started going down range, there's almost like a little bit of imposter syndrome, where you're there and you're like. I'm not fucking sure if I'm ready for this. Did you have that experience too? That I think that is a perfect description of I, the first time I saw a real life terrorist. It was like, you know, watching going to the zoo. Like mm -hmm. I, it, this, I know this lion's behind a cage. Is this a real lion? Is this a real gorilla? I can't believe, you know, I'm seeing this. Am I allowed to shoot? What, what the, the rules were so, you know, uh, black and white at that point where you didn't know if we were allowed to take the first time you get shot at, you go from scared to angry to now wondering, am I going to go to jail? Like, is this legal? You know what yeah. I mean? And, mm -hmm. and it's a lot to think about. It's not certainly not what our parents had to deal with in Vietnam or granddad in World War Two where they were just like, boom, let the And everything's go. on helmet cams or, ca or cams oh. on, strapped on and all that kind of stuff. And the embedded reporter is mm -hmm. running 4K video. And it's not like, you know, making their film, uh, getting ready for the evening news two days away where they're getting their film uh, checked out at Kodak. This is, they're filming you and you're on the nightly news that night. So if anything goes wrong or goes sideways, you know, you're, you're going to be in trouble. It, it's a lot to process, but once Fallujah is actually an easier fight to prepare yourself for than having a civilian population there, there you, you've got to make sure that you're taking the shots and you're, you're protecting children and women and innocent people in Fallujah. This was old Testament. If it was on the street, it had a rocket, it had a machine gun and you were dropping them, you know, as much as you can. I got to say, listening to you talk about that, nothing was easy in 2004 in Fallujah. Nothing. And I I mean, the respect that I have for somebody like you that went through what you did, it clearly affects you. Whenever you were, give, you were given a speech one time and you talked about how somebody else will raise your children if you come at the United States of America. And that type of talk only comes from people who have seen what real combat looks like. And you, it's almost like that old Mattis line was like, I'm pleading with you with tears in my eyes. If you fuck right. with me, we'll kill you all. It's essentially right. the same right. thing. And can you talk to us? And I'm sure you've gone through this story ad nauseum, but for our listeners that haven't heard your story, can you walk us through what you wrote your first book about house to house and how you ended up ultimately receiving the medal of honor? We, so we were in Fallujah. Uh, we had every time we got a mission, it was always eight to 10 bad guys. It was never 10. It was rarely eight. But that was the number we gave. We're looking for eight to 10 guys. We, we track them down in a city block. Uh, we've got our Bradley fighting vehicles and our tanks, uh, which are thermals uh, at night. No one's leaving this block. We know they're in here. And we just start preparing it. But we're going to have to go in there eventually and clear them out. Uh, and we just started clearing these houses. We started seeing blood. We saw food. We saw, you know, we saw evidence that they were there. And then we get into the last house and uh, our our, uh, our saw gunner, uh, Oli, opens up a door and there's two belt fed machine guns under a stairwell with a Jersey barrier. Like they built a bunker in their house. Mm -hmm. The whole house is rigged to blow. And we get into a crossfire between two enemy machine guns. Our machine guns outside, we're trapped in this house. Bullets are coming through walls and ricocheting everywhere. And I'm on one side and the rest of my platoon is on the other side. You know, honestly, there's really, in the military at war, you get a, it's a lottery. 
and you get your number called and you either do it or you don't. Uh, but it was because I had really no other choice but to suppress these guys mm-hmm. and get our guys out. So I, I my machine gun was hit. Uh, my rifle was hit uh, with a, a round. I exchanged it for a machine gun. I stood in the doorway. I shot at those boys uh, to keep their heads down. Our guys got out. And then I, I just got pissed off because I, I've never broken contact in my life. And down the street, Brad Castle is in that house of hell. Mm-hmm. Rafael Peralta just threw himself on a grenade. Mm-hmm. These names have become almost iconic of my yeah. generation. Everybody is doing something in this little neighborhood. It's a really bad spot. They killed my company commander, Sean Sims. They killed my Sergeant Major, Stephen Falkenberg. They killed my executive officer, Edward Iwan. And they killed a buddy of mine from Buffalo, JC Madison. Um, It was personal and it was real. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't imagine these guys leaving this house. It was so tough to find the enemy in that year. They were ghosts. They would blow you up and run away. If I could get them in a house where they can't get out, I'm going to take advantage of that Mm -hmm. as much as I can. And honestly, I I was shitty at math. I only thought there was two of them. (laughs) You know what I mean? I only (laughs) saw two. So I'm like, (laughs) I'm good for two. I'm good for two. You know what I mean? So I figure I can get two of them. I just shot 200 rounds at three feet. Surely they're wounded. Well, it turns out I can't shoot a, a saw. And, and it turns out. It turns and I out love that, that honesty because people think, oh, you're a military guy. You know how to shoot every weapon in the arsenal. Not no. true. Not true at all. No, I haven't shot a saw in years. I mean, I'm a squad leader. I, you know, it's been a while. But the gun ran away. It's a machine gun. Mm-hmm. And when you, when, when you pull an automatic weapon, that, you know, unlike a semi, when you pull that trigger, it goes. Sometimes saws run away. Mm-hmm. And this saw ran away and no matter, I let go of the trigger and it was still going. So I ran through those rounds far too fast. It wasn't accurate. Um, they weren't hurt. And when I, I, I had to go back in there. Uh, and so I set up uh, machine gunners. How did gunners that fuck around. you up mentally? When you know that you just laid 200 rounds down and you're like, fuck man. Like it's almost like those <laughs> dreams where you're falling and you can't stop or you're naked and you're trying to run yeah. fast and you can't do it. I imagine that's what yeah. it felt with the combat version of that. You know what it was, man? It was these, I love these guys. When I'm 20, I was 28. This was on my birthday. So it's a Marine Corps birthday. Right. So it's, I'm, I'm 29 on the Marine Corps birthday in 2004. And, uh, all I thought about was I couldn't say I love you to another man when I'm 29 because I'm far too alpha to do that. But I couldn't express ever how I felt about people that I cared about. And I love these guys so much. And all I remember is when I was training them in Kosovo, in Germany, everywhere we went, I just was like, God, give me a moment that I could show how I feel about these guys. And this was my moment. And I completely missed the layup with two seconds left in the game. I missed this field goal. I missed my shot. Everything I've been asking for the opportunity, I missed. And then I'm looking at my guys and they're talking to other uh, squad leaders about what to do. I felt like I lost them. Mm. I felt like they were looking at other people like, oh, well, my guy just nutted up. My Mm -hmm. guy just ran out of a house like so I'm like, I'm going to get these boys back and I'm going to get them back old school style. And I'm not going to risk them. I'm not bringing them in. I'm going to do this myself. There's only two of them. F them. I got Lawson, who's another uh, squad leader. He's only got a nine mil and two magazines. And we're like, let's just bum rush them. They'll never expect us to come through that same door again, like a bunch of assholes. Like who would do that? Mm-hmm. That's such a stupid idea. You know, that back door is open. I got my machine gunners moving around. They're going to hear those guys from the back, and we'll just we'll just come through the front door again and see what they do. And uh, it worked for those two. It just turned out there was a couple other guys in that house, uh, and they were healthy and they were they were high. And that was another problem: is that mm-hmm. these boys were doing Timothy Leary amount of drugs, man. Mm-hmm. And it's really tough to fight high people. I mean, that's uh, like the don't... berserkers from the Vikings. Like that's exactly the reason why they were so tough is because they had that almost PCP effect where they're not going to go down unless they're really, really down. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the Sunni Wahhabi, which is the radical right. form of Sunni, uh, they had a, an old school, during the Crusades, they had Hashishians, which were guys that were just like doing hash all day. And they just were like balls to the wall because, <laughs> I mean, I would probably do hash too if I was up against Oh, all the weed that they pass American. in Afghanistan? I was like, <laughs> I'd put that shit in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. Like if, if I was going up against tanks and, you know, the Air Force and the Army and the Marine Corps, absolutely I'd be, you know, I'd be higher than a kite because mm-hmm. this is going to end horribly. But when you're shooting at those guys and you, you, you're, it's so dark, you don't know, is this the same dude? Is this like, I, I shot a guy five times in the chest and he ran away. Jeez. So maybe it's the same dude or maybe it's a different dude. And not that I'm, you know, racially profiling anyone in, in Iraq, but in 2004, Everyone kind of wore the same uniform with the same beard. Um, and they were just rolling through the door with with AKs and just they were fearless. So when I found fear in their face, I used that to just feed the machine of let's just I'm gonna roll until my luck runs out, you know? At least I can put a dent in these boys, and I know a platoon's gonna roll in here and end it. Uh I just kept going until you know, my luck ran out and it didn't run out. So I, you know, sometimes in blackjack, you just keep, <laughs> you keep doubling down, you know? And you hear that old phrase, one of my favorite phrases that we use in the Marine Corps, and I'm, you definitely are the embodiment of it, is that we move to the sounds of the guns, that we march to the sounds of the guns. And that doesn't mean behind us, that means in front of us. And we continue to push forward. Was there ever a time after that? When did you find, were you finally able to calm your brain, because I think that's the difficult part of really wrapping your head around living Medal of Honor recipients, like what Woody Williams and others have had to go through where you experience this intense trauma. But at the moment, the military doesn't realize your chain of command is not like that's Medal of Honor worthy. You continue to go. How did you calm your brain after that incident where you kept in charge and you kept moving? You know, I got to tell you, I... um... I don't know if I, my brain's ever calmed down since, to be mm. honest with you. Like, I think when you go through something like that, uh, I, I, I shot this guy, the last guy, second last guy that I that we took out in that building. I had hit him repeatedly. I beat this guy with my helmet, my sappy plate. I'm finally using a Gerber on him. And I'm thinking to myself, he's got that much fight in him. Mm-hmm. And I'm exhausted. And he's kicking my ass. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, and then I hear another guy totally healthy that I've never met before screaming at this guy. And I'm thinking, this is it. This is it. What level of insanity do you have to go through to get through it? And I remember coming home from block leave in Iraq and I was pissed off at a UPS guy who looked all happy. I saw a bunch of 20 something year old dudes with their hot girlfriends and they're getting lattes. And I'm thinking, why are these people not, they don't even know there's a war going on. Mm-hmm. Like I was so pissed off that everything was normal and I was going back into hell. And I, I ran into a Vietnam veteran who gives me all my wisdom. And that Vietnam veteran said, your problem is you think you're coming home and you're never going to be able to fight. If you think you're coming home, you're going to worry about your men. You're going to worry about losing someone give it up, close your eyes, see your funeral, you're dead. Now go back and give them a fucking fight. Mm -hmm. Give them the fight of their lives. You fight with everything you got because you, your job in this world is to make sure that your mom and dad never see a Mujahideen in the United States. Your job is to wipe these boys off the map. And if they have kids, Their kids are going to be like, dad's not around because dad made a horrible decision. Dad should have gone to dental school. Dad chose to fight Americans. And Americans are going to wipe you off the heap of history. That's what we're going to do when we fight. We're not there to stalemate. We're not there to make peace. We're not there to make you feel better about us with your your college degree in English lit. Mm -hmm. We're there to fight, and we're going to crack skulls to do it. And when I started realizing... Literally. And when I started realizing that it didn't matter, my job was these men, my job was my mission, and my job was to win in a fight. Well, guess what? There's no such thing as being tired. 
there's no such thing as intestinal fortitude and how much left, how much you have in your tank. You go until you're dead. And I wasn't dead, uh, wounded, hurt, whatever. My guys are going through the same thing I was. But after that fight, after that house, we became a wrecking ball because now it's like, no matter what they throw at us, we got audibles, you know, and we've seen it. And now you're not afraid. Uh, you're, you've been shot at at point blank. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's something, there's something amazing about, you know, sometimes showing up. A lot of guys are tough behind cover when they're shooting, but when you're right in their face, man, it takes a nanosecond of pause and hesitation. And I think a lot of these guys thought that we were soft or they thought that we're not going to, we're, we're smart bombs and lasers only. We're night vision and bombs. That's all we do is drones. No, no, we're going to knock on your door and kick your chest in. And oh, okay. uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was great to be a part of that fight. And once you go through that, the imposter syndrome's gone. Like, and I think that's the, done. Once you have your first major firefight, everything changes because it's yes, like sir. things slow down for you. You're not completely nervous. You're like, I can get through this. I'm going to be okay. As long as I'm doing what I'm trained to do, maybe something happens. Even if I'm not trained, like a, a round comes through a wall and hits you in the forearm, like it did me, <laughs> but you have these moments after you get your first <laughs> firefight, you're like, okay, let's fucking do this. Let's calm down. And that sticks with you for the rest of your life in super stressful situations where you can calm it down. I'm sure that was the case for you as well. Well, look at it. How was a guy like you doing, you know, a broadcast for the whole country? What, what right do you have to do that? Are you any good? Can you compete? Well, guess what? After you've been shot at, there's not a damn thing you can't do. Mm -hmm. Are you going to talk to the girl at the end of the bar that everyone else is intimidated to talk to? No, I'm going to talk to her. Yeah, my wife's hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you going to go for the job interview that everyone says you're not qualified for? Screw it. You know, there's nothing. And, and by the way, that's really intimidating for civilians. Because mm -hmm. once you have someone that's basically like, hey, I'm not going to die at the end of this. I can wait in line for my latte at Starbucks. No one's going to die here. It's not the end of the world. I'm going to take chances, calculated risk. Veterans, combat veterans make amazing financial people because we don't need, you know, oh, my God, we've got to have 95% risk assessment. You've never had 95% in your life, yeah. certainly. Yeah. You've, done things, you've done things with like 2%. This is a really stupid idea. I don't think the military's ever accomplished anything at 95% <laughs> rate, ever. <laughs> no, no. You just do it because you have an obligation and fidelity. And, and I think our biggest problem as veterans is we come home, and while civilians like before they trust, we trust before we like. I've I know guys for twenty years. I still don't like them. You know what I mean. But mm -hmm. I trust them. Yeah, I trust them. And and, I, and I, we think yeah. I think that's one of the things that I love about you and Flo and Groberg talked about it as well. Both of you guys give so much credit to the to the unit that you are in, and that's the reason for your new book. Um, Remember the Ramrods. Could you talk about how special your guys are still to this day, even? 18 years later. So we're, we cancel each other's vote out. We like different sports teams. We look different. Some of us had great dads. Some of us didn't even know who our fathers were. We're from the city, the suburbs, uh, every walk of life. Um, some of us are straight. Most of us are straight. Some of us are gay. Mm -hmm. No one gives a damn about anything. I don't care about any ass, all the things that separate us in this world of divisiveness and tribe. We are one tribe. And those guys are more than family because they were willing to die for each other and, and die for me. And that's a love I don't think I've seen in the civilian world. It's a devotion. It's a, it's a connection. And I thought for all these years, man, I thought I missed war. Because in war, I felt like I had a purpose. Mm -hmm. I felt like I, I, I was needed. I didn't miss that. I missed them. Right. I missed the relationships. And it took this Medal of Honor 15 years later for me to realize, wait a minute, I don't give a damn about the war. I care about the fact that I had meaning and I had purpose and mm -hmm. direction. And I need to find that again in my life. And so I picked up the phone and I started to 
honor the word, the promises that I made years ago. I want to be in these guys' lives. I want to be, uh, I'm a forever soldier. I'm a, a forever NCO. I want to be center to their lives again, like, because I do love them. And I'm at a point now in my age where I'm not afraid to say I love you. I'm not afraid to say I miss you and I hope you're well. And I want you to be okay. We got to find our purpose as a generation. We, and veterans have got to find why, why we're needed, not in the fight, but why we're needed in this world and the value that we bring to the table. We have far too many guys that are, are you know, suffering from addiction and suicidal ideation, and it's bullshit. It, we have to remind each other why we're needed, because what we're doing today is far more important than what we did in uniform. Oh, I completely agree with that. And I, I like what you said about the veteran earlier in the conversation when you talked about how you were able to do that because you happened to be in a crazy situation at a crazy time and you were there and you were able to do what you did. But I'm sure you would say, just like Kyle Carpenter and other folks, that if somebody else was in that position, they would have done the same thing because that's how we were trained to do things, right? Well, they did it. I mean, right. the, the thing, you know, it's one thing when you when you make a postulate of I'm sure my guys would have done something else. The very next day, I got three guys, you know, uh, that are uh, guard, you know, shielding the body of a guy that's getting tagged. I got a guy who gets his ankle blown off and tells the medic, you know, uh, roll me over. Max Fields like roll me over and treat my ankle while I, I keep popping this saw. Every day I saw that. So it, it, it was literally you don't have to fantasize what these guys are going to do because you know they're going to do it. You've seen them do it. I don't care about, you know, legacy and all these things that people talk about when they're dying. If you're going to talk about the Medal of Honor story, you got to talk about the ramrods. They didn't get any attention. They didn't get the awards they deserved. Uh, I got this thing filmed by a Time Magazine reporter, Michael Ware. And now everyone can see it on a documentary or you can see the videotape. And it talks about one action, one person. I'm saying, look, that's not how I was raised in the Army. That's not how we're raised in the infantry. We're all about the team. If you're going to remember the story, remember the team. And that's why we remember the Ramrods. And it's a fantastic book. Again, if you haven't been to Fallujah, if you're just a civilian listener that wants to get an accurate portrayal, I say that Generation Kill is one of the most accurate military books that there is as far as real experience real conversation and how things go down that's not fluffy it's going to challenge you this book if you read it it's going to challenge your disposition if you're not used to hearing incredibly violent things this book is fantastic and i'm so glad that you wrote it david thank you hey thank you for your service thank you for representing us uh as veterans of the generation and uh happy veterans day happy marine corps birthday as well Happy Marine Corps birthday to you and happy regular birthday to you as well. <laughs> I love that guy. Yep. I do. Like talking As soon to as him you and... were done the interview, you started texting us. You're like, oh my God, that was, I just, you said how much you loved talking to him and that was awesome. And it's, I like those conversations where I walk away feeling that way, especially when somebody else is on the different side of the political spectrum as me. Mm -hmm. Like, ha like, because it's really like you have differing views, especially with elections right now midterms and all that yeah everything in politics seems so divisive so it's nice to have a conversation with somebody that maybe i wouldn't normally agree with and mm -hmm. that's okay like it's yeah. okay to have those disagreements and focus on what he did for the country and receiving the medal of honor because it was absolutely bananas i yeah. mean imagine but, legitimately i talked yeah. to him about it some beating someone to, having to not just beating someone to death with a kevlar but having to in yeah. order to survive like this isn't a thing where you're like he went out with a Kevlar looking for somebody like right. it was Ragnar Lothbrok in the early Viking days like that's not what happened yeah he had to survive so he beat somebody to fucking death with a Kevlar Crazy. Yeah, that's not what you expect to have to do ever in the military unless World War II going like, off to war. like yeah, those exactly. type of things happen you didn't expect that in the right. war on terror no no and I just think you know, growing up and then certainly when we were in the military, I feel like most of the Medal of Honor recipients were from battles and wars past. And, and we would not have heard about them, maybe only read about them in, in history books. They weren't really walking among us. And now in the last 20 years with how many folks uh, ha have done valorous acts that are deserving of that medal for us to be able to speak to them and, and bring their stories 
to listeners, I think is a really uh, cool e experience uh, for all involved. Especially the civilian listeners who might not have heard yeah. any of these stories that are going on. And one thing about David, too, he's one of two living Iraq veterans who are Medal of Honor recipients. Yeah. The things that people did in Iraq deserve way more than two Medal of Honors. I do not understand why that's the process that we go through where in World War II and all the other conflicts, really, they would give out Medal of Honors for acts that deserve it. And now it's like they're holding it like it. Yeah, they're holding it for themselves. And it makes no sense to do that at all. But let's have a little bit more fun show. We're going to transition and we're going to go around number two. And this is a our, this is a story that really Kate brought to our attention earlier this week when she posted the tweet into our group chat and I saw it and I thought that shit's way too common and with the 96 coming up with Christmas leave block coming up around the corner we want to remind some leaders about some shit right Catherine yeah um I think we've been talking about retention issues in mm -hmm. all branches of the military and trouble recruiting and how important work-life balance is to people like that attitude of well it's the military your life comes second like that's kind of antiquated now like, people there. are like, no, no, we've seen that we can have both. Like, let's, as long as it makes sense for our training, like, whatever, we can have both. It's okay. Um, so this tweet went kind of viral, so I thought we should talk about it on the show. This guy on Twitter, King of Cavalry, obviously also former military himself, <laughs> posted this tweet. and it's Humble, just, too. Very humble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm the King of we Cavalry. Can't. Yeah. Suck um, it, Cons. You're just the prince or yeah. duke. <laughs> I was the peasant of MPs myself. I was at the very bottom. Um, but he posted this photo of his family looking beautiful. And it's the classic family wedding photo with mm -hmm. whatever. They're standing in front of a beautiful building. Everyone's in their dresses and suits. And he says, had to get a cutout of my daughter for my son's wedding since her U.S. Army unit denied her leave to attend her brother's wedding. Very sad. And that sad. cutout, in case you're listening and you don't, you can't picture what it is. Picture one of those uh, pictures of Portnoy that are out in front of the high noons places at like grocery stores, the huge stack of high noons, and he's there. It's just a life size. Yeah, it's a cardboard cutout, cutout of his daughter mm -hmm. that is human sized, and it's and she's, she's in and she's in uniform. In uniform, and he included her in the family photo. And this really, the post went viral, got hundreds of replies, thousands of likes, and from people on both sides of the fence, some saying. Well, it's the fucking army, dude. Deal with it. And so many other people saying, oh, man, the same thing happened to me. I missed X, Y, Z. And there were like literally dozens and dozens of people listing major, major life milestones they missed because their command wouldn't let them leave. And so people in their replies were like, well, were you guys doing any serious? It was like, no, they literally just didn't let me go. And I still and regret it. And this is the reason why, yeah. because some of those old timers, we need Chief Warrant Officer Bobby Yarbo to be back <laughs> on the scene, yeah. just on, not just on Facebook, Twitter and everywhere, because some of the responses are very typical, I think of older veterans that have been out for a while. One of them, C. Anderson, it's one of those classic names, Anderson, with a bunch of numbers. You know you're going to get a shitty opinion. Yeah. It happens, he said, it happens part of the... It, it happens. happens part well, yeah. in your defense, you're not reading that well because he didn't he type it out that sense. well. It's, it's, right. I was his like, grammar that, sucks. That's right. not you. It happens part <laughs> the sacrifices of being in the military. Miss holidays, birthday, and other events. Try growing up or being in the military family during the Cold War, and your dad is part of the SAC alert crew on Christmas Day. Buddy, every single person that has been in during the War on Terror knows exactly what that's right. like because everybody's deployed, everybody's gone overseas, or they've all worked long hours. It's not special, and it was your fucking dad. It wasn't even you. Like, right. Why do, but I how mean, do that you makes a great point, this? too, just because you, like, you're admitting that made your childhood difficult and shitty. Like... You're admitting that's hard. Why would you wish, want that for other people? Like, why? I still need it to be hard because I did hard things, so I want hard people. And that wasn't the only one. Another fella said, not unsurprising, a selfish post. Maybe learn how jobs and vacation work. Recognize or lack of senior, seniority or accrued time. Consider what she has volunteered for and all the other things she may miss due to putting others first. In other words, it's not about you. So in the his defense, worst. I mean, he. the one thing I will say this woman, like, every now and then our parents pop off on social media for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And we're like, oh, God. Oh, my God. Um, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, like, my dad lurks on Twitter. And I'll post some, like, modern day, like, young people acronym about, like, pop and pussy or something like that. And he doesn't know it. And he's like, oh, that's a silly one. And he, like, retweets. And I'm like, no, 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 stop. 
Don't want you doing that. For all we know, she's dying that her dad did this because he tagged the army and everything. If I was her, I would kind of be beside myself. <laughs> like, I'm not I have one lie. of the worst experience with parents of all time. I was in boot camp still, and my mom and stepdad came to Paris Island and were sta- like parked outside of where our company barracks were, the squad base that we were at. And my drill instructor saw my mom waving and saying hi, honey, from a, a while away. And my drill instructors recognize it and fucked me up. <laughs> we yeah, yeah. We went back inside. So I do get him saying it's not about you, dad. Like this is, mm-hmm. you know, between your kids. So like the dad taking to Twitter and, and tagging the army, I did feel like was a little much. But no, it, did like spark, it. it did spark a good conversation <laughs> about the work-life balance. Um Irish Ice SP said, I'm going out on a limb here and presuming the brother got married on a weekend. So maybe taking Thursday, Friday off, at least for travel, rehearsal, dinner stuff. Like, wow, two, maybe three days to go without her absolutely essential present at this time. So they're saying, like, it's a wedding weekend. You maybe miss one day of work. Like, generally, you're not working on the weekends unless something super crazy is going on. This person's saying it is shitty that they couldn't go because, like, well, and especially, I'm sorry, none of us do shit. At least when I was in, we didn't do shit on Fridays. <laughs> no, right? Not but... especially not right before '96. Cons as a former officer had been in command positions, like in platoon leader and things like yeah. that. What were some of the scenarios where you would have canceled leave for somebody? Well, let me start by saying, and I don't know, I, just based on what you guys just said, I don't think you're gonna like this. We don't know the other side of this here. We don't know what she was scheduled to be doing that weekend. If she is in, you know, like Bullock, brand new training, and they're scheduled to be out on a field op, and it's essential that she has to complete that to complete Bullock, we don't know the other side of that. So I think it's a little unfair to completely come down and say, well, what the hell? That's that's BS. She should be able to leave for a wedding. Not necessarily. Now, do I, I think like not allowing someone to, to go to a, a big event is, is okay all the time? No. I just think it's important to hear the other side here because it is possible. It's like, well, if we let her go for this wedding and and miss this essential training that maybe we can't redo for just her and let her graduate from Bullock without completing a particular requirement, what does that say to everybody else? So I think my only reason for thinking that's not the case is that her dad was clearly also in the military and he's been in communication uh, with her. Yeah, so, but he wouldn't know. But, I don't think he would Yeah. Know. But I think she, she oh, listen, would tell him like that. I don't even know. Like I was in the military. Your point. But okay. I, yeah, I think, I think she would, I would assume, be communicating with him and be like, yeah, dad, this is like absolutely training I can't miss. In which case, if I was him, I wouldn't take to Twitter about it. Like, I feel the only reason I, I think feel a dad like, still would. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. A dad <laughs> I think still so. would. I get involved right. with my kids' fourth grade class. I'm getting involved in everything. Yeah, but the only, the only reason thing too, I. Well, the sorry. only thing. Go ahead. It's just, there's so many. Because you're like, it seems so dumb. You're like, there has to be a reason they're keeping her. But the only thing making me think, like, no, probably not, is the amount of replies of people who were kept from such major life moments for, like, no fucking reason. Some of these stories No, I'm not are saying that doesn't happen. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, and I'm also not suggesting, well, I missed a bunch of my friends' weddings when I was in Iraq, so everyone else yeah. in the Army should miss shit, too. I missed, no, I don't prescribe I both to that. Of my we all miss stuff. Both of my grandmother's funerals, so I, like, yeah, I get we it. we all miss terrible. stuff. But that doesn't mean like, all right, so now life has to be terrible for everybody else from now until forever. I'm just saying I would like to hear the other side of this before I just blanket come down on the army. The other side, though, cons, comes from the chief of staff of the army and the sergeant major of the army whenever they put out their work-life balance. They say that even if you have training that you're supposed to go to the field with, that it's equivalent to a birthday game or recital. Like, it's not that important. When you're talking about major one-time events, the army from headquarters army saying the only equivalent to missing a wedding funeral or one-time events the only thing that's going to stop you from that is a deployment a major deployment is the only thing that should stop you from doing that that's the guidance from the general of the army and the sergeant major of the army so no matter what they say if you have to go to the field for three weeks not a good enough excuse according to the the chief of staff of the army and the sergeant major of the army this is their doctrine company commanders battalion commanders regimental commanders and regimental generals should all follow that instruction but I, I think, and I, you, you know this as well as anybody, I don't think doctrine is always black and white. I, I do think there needs to be interpretation sometimes. So I, I'm looking at this 
Um, I guarantee this, this, this image. You, I guarantee you, if you go up, if you said, hey, we have a two week field op where we're just going to do regular training. We don't have a deployment anywhere in the next six months. If you went to the chief of staff of the army and said, hey, does this one specialist need to go on this field? Tra- Will that completely invalidate all the other training? The answer is going to be a resounding no. The only people who no, want to do this No, but she's an stuff officer. At May- no, is she? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She's an officer. So I don't, that's why I'm saying I don't know where she is and what she's doing. Cause I, I did Bullock. But and it's there the were same, it's the same you, principle. Like the principle doesn't say for enlisted people only. It says for no, all no, no, soldiers. No, 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 I know. Well, no, but my point is that like, if maybe she's at Bullock and then that weekend is the weekend they're doing land nav and they're not going to ever have a chance to, to redo land nav. And if she misses that, then she gets passed through Bullock without having completed a major requirement. That's what I'm saying. And I'm, Again, I'm speculating because we don't know yeah, the full story here. We only know that. But even we if we don't know, know this, this particular story, we know the overarching themes. And I think a lot of yeah. times we can get caught up in that small detail and not understand that it's a full military wide problem. You can go into the individual stories all I mean, you want. I mean, that's why to, we're talking but to the major because theme it went viral is, because this is a theme. It's a problem, right? That's the reason it went viral. The reason it's making like news now. I'm sure that we'll see this talked about on like Task and Purpose Military dot com soon. Mm-hmm. Um, like one of the examples, this woman Kelly, my husband's four day pass to come home for his own wedding wasn't approved until almost midnight before he was supposed to fly home early the next morning. So this poor guy's that's, sitting there like, am I going to make my wedding or not? Um, she says, just that's, a I think, just a lack of Just a heartwarming power ability. play and welcome into military family life. Wonder why we got out. And like this sentiment was repeated like over and 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 over. It's to be fair, problem. this could be a yeah. E2 that got engaged with some stripper that he sure. met the weekend before. Still, I don't care. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't care. either. I don't care at all either. Uh, there was one that kind of made me laugh, though. One last example that we'll give yeah. here. It was a guy that was trying to go to a baby shower. I think it was somebody in his family got a baby shower. And it got denied because it said men don't go on baby showers. Oh, this is funny. So yeah. he said That was what his CEO wrote in red paper on the document. Red paper, they- cross it out. Men don't go to baby showers. So this same soldier said for his remarks, instead of going home for a baby shower, he said, going home to Appalachian Mountains to drink whiskey, whiskey res- rescue bears, or wrestle bears, and shoot lots of guns. I also plan to grow out a beard, chop down 100 trees with my axe, and eat 10 pounds of thick-cut bacon with my wife, who I plan on having lots of unprotected sex with because I'm a man, and that's how we do it. Football. Yeah. <laughs> but- that's great. Leave I like that. Approved. I like that. Leave Listen, approved. I'll just say, approved. last thing I'll say, as uh, coming from a leadership position, if you let one then you're going to get a whole lot more and then you have to deal with those as well. Fucking good. I'm just saying. Yeah, as long as you're not doing anything hugely important, fine. I mean, that's basically like block leave. Everybody wants to go on leave. Cool. Whenever you come back, we're doing some shit that's going to suck. Like, I think you can get around it. You know, if you still want to make things difficult, cool. You guys can go. You can do your thing. But when you come back, everything's we're going to do some rough shit. I don't think you should make things difficult just for the sake of making them difficult either. I I. (laughs) <laughs> when it comes to training, I think you make it as difficult as possible. So then whenever you deploy, you've already dealt with a lot of situations. Okay. Um, let's right, move so. on to round number three. We're going to do a little bit of a safety brief here because, folks, I know you're going to be flying around. If you actually do get your leave and liberty approved, you're going to be flying around the country. So we want to give you some advice to how to get through TSA safely. Kate, what do we got here? Yeah. Well, so I didn't realize, like, I know you can't bring in liquids. And so my brain always just told me, like, going through TSA, you can't bring, like, food in general is a Mm no-go. But then I saw people taking, like, whole McDonald's meals through and shit like that. I was like, oh. So now when I... fitness buffs carry, like, Liver King-style folks carrying eight hamburger patties in, like, a a tray, and they're eating it on the plane just straight up? I had no idea. So I... Pat's parents are from New York City originally. They're from Queens. And so whenever we go visit them now, I get a dozen bagels, and I put them... I plop the bagel bag right on the fucking conveyor belt, and I take bagels through. It's whatever. Um, But raw chicken I have yet to do, but this lady did. Um, A prospective air traveler was roasted by the Transportation Security Administration on social media Monday after officers with the federal agency said it caught the person trying to conceal 
a gun inside a raw <laughs> chicken stashed in their carry-on luggage. It's got to be a first. Good initiative, bad judgment. Go buy the hoodie. Yeah. The weapon was flagged by TSA at Fort Lauderdale International Airport in Florida. I mean, classic Florida. Mm-hmm. Where officers found it wrapped in what looked like a thin paper packaging. You know what won't keep chicken raw chicken juice in? Paper. paper. Thin mm-hmm. paper packaging. No. Um, thin paper packaging and hidden inside a raw chicken. The photo of this made me want to vomit all over my shoes. <laughs> I know. It's uh, so funny. It looked like a wet ass I chicken. Mean, yeah, you can have a roasted chicken, a raw chicken that I feel like is butchered and cleaned and all. This is like you got this rotisserie chicken style, like this hen from the dollar store. Like it's a gross looking chicken too. Yeah, uh, post shared to the TSA Instagram account Monday included a photo of the uncooked bird being examined by an airport security person in the screening area and the gun once it was removed and unwrapped. It's caption leaned heavily into Thanksgiving themed puns. God, I would love to be the TSA Instagram lady. You would be so Starting good at with it. There's a personal fowl here. <laughs> fowl mm-hmm. is a chicken. Um, the plot <laughs> chickens as we barrel our way closer to Thanksgiving. For us, it's time to be thankful that our officers are always working around the cluck to keep you safe. Take, for instance, this Can You Believe It? Can You Believe It? at Fort Lauderdale Airport. We hate to beak it to you here, but stuffing a firearm in your holiday bird for travel is just a waste of time. The idea wasn't even half-baked. It was raw, greasy, and obviously unsupervised. The only roast happening here is the poor packing choice. Feather you I like gotta it or say, not. that's the first thing TSA has done in years that I agree with. <laughs> yeah. Like, as normally yeah. I'm abolish the TSA kind of guy. I don't want those people at the airport. Make us go through one little metal detector and that'll be it. Um, I don't want to do it for the rest of my life in perpetuity. Perpetuity. In perpetuity. Perpetuity. In perpetuity. perpetuity. Thank you, cons. Um, so I, I think that this is a great idea. And Kate, I think if you ever leave Barstool, that this is definitely, you would have government uh, priority because you're a veteran status. You would be able to get this job. I think TSA social media manager is right up your alley. Oh man, let me run Ooh. all the veteran, military, VA. I would make it so much more fun. I, I Dare I say pop and pussy again? <laughs> I bet, it just feels like the day to say it. These accounts would be bussy if I was in charge of them. Um, fun. Did you guys watch DuckTales? Growing up, oh yeah, the cartoon. Yeah. Yep. You remember when the, the the I forget their names, but the people that were always in jail and they would bake a cake and put the chisel in the cake. Oh, oh yeah, that's what this reminds me of. Yeah, a little bit of that's, Shawshank that's Redemption this. too is, they is what it's yeah. about. I mean, my favorite part of the Ducktales, obviously Scrooge McDuck. If you have any, mm-hmm. I mean, granted, if you jumped off a diving board into coins, you would kill yourself <laughs> instantly. Like yeah. that wouldn't be great. But you would have. A, and you'd have all your money stored in this place that has like a diving board and gold coins. If you want to have a wallet that's better than that, make sure that you go with our friends at Ridge mm. Wallet. It holds up to 12 cards that room for cash. There's over 30 different colors and style, including carbon fire and burnt titanium. It's made with RFID blocking technology. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah, it doesn't it people- block? Because there's, there's things from they can like walk by you now and just like zap all your information not, on your phone or your credit cards not just that i learned that they could do it with your key fob too like if you have a key fob at your house oh. there's like a connector device that somebody could go to your door get the signal from your key fob and that is transferred to another key fob what? that's how they're stealing that's how they stole my fucking f-250 so fast Holy like shit. it's because wow. they do that boom boom and then they're in and out in two seconds because they can unlock the wow. door the alarm goes off and all that shit my so goodness. i looked into how to get rid of it they could do it at gas stations and places like that with your credit card the one that has a little if you have the credit card that could tap they could do the same yeah. shit so they're recommending to have these types of wallet that you can get at ridge um Hold on. If you get it, Ridge Wallet. Yeah, I knew there was another word. It's wallet. <laughs> Ridge Wallet. Uh, make sure that you do. And if you can get one, a little box that you could put in by your door, you can protect yourself there. But these things are awesome. It secures anywhere from not just your wallet, but two keys as well. It organizes your key in a compact silhouette and fold out for easy access. There's six colors and style of the key case that you can get. Go to Ridge.com and use the promo code ZBT for 10% off your order. You're not going to regret that. Let's move on to some save rounds and alibis. Nick, we'll start with you. Save round. Just want to make sure everyone continues to go to the YouTube and please hit subscribe. Please follow us everywhere. TikTok on Twitter, Instagram, everywhere. Uh, we appreciate your follows. Thank you. Kate? Me? Um, gosh, on Veterans Day, I have a video coming out with a VFW post 
a little, little humble little VFW post on the Schuylkill River outside Philadelphia where Hurricane Ida, when it came through, the Schuylkill River goes right through Philly. Everything along that river just got completely fucked. And this was, you know, a lot of these posts are fading away and dying out. And this one was going strong, like had such a strong presence. I went down there to talk to some of those guys and it's men, women, like at the, every era, every war, like they're all there and they do so much of the community and it flooded all the way up to their roof and like total their entire, like just this humble little building on the river, but just screwed it. And for the last year, they have just been scraping tooth and nail to get it together. So I'm excited to, um, hopefully it looks like Barstool might be able to help them out in some way. So I'm excited for that. Some of them are going to be coming to the game on Friday, but I feel like that's an awesome way to kick off Veterans Day is by helping out that post right there and seeing what we can and do. And if you still want to go to the Barstool Invitational, we still have some tickets available. If you go to vettix.com, you can get you can get tickets for free. We put some more that are available to veterans. So if you guys want to go grab those up, yeah. feel free to do that. Um, but so we'll also be, I'm going to be doing a blog with the GoFundMe forum too. Eight, eight, five bucks, like five bucks, 10 bucks. They said they're, t- uh, I just spoke to the post commander yesterday, last night. And he said that this couldn't come at a better time too, because they're, I forget if it's taxes or something is due. And they're, they're like going into debt now on even the probably property taxes. property yeah. taxes is what it is. He said, we can't, we're just, we're at, we're about to lose this post. So, um, anyways, just excited that hopefully something really good comes from that. Also petition the city. Give them a fucking break, man. I know. It's the VFW. Give them a break. They should get an exemption anyways. Um, Um, What about, is that it, Kate? Other thing. Oh, I watched the 247th Marine Corps birthday message. Mm. It's over 10 minutes long. It's a doozer. A lot of badass training footage with a focus on jungle warfare. Is that where we're going next? A lot of those, that Navy SEAL poster where they're coming out of the swamp with their guns, you know, it gets me... (laughs) Once again, rock hard. Um, mm-hmm. Little cameo in the beginning by General Mattis, that one where, where the the person interviewing him is like, what keeps you awake at night? And he's like, nothing. I keep other people awake at night. And Still I just one picture, of the best modern quotes there is. I just picture being drunk at the ball as a Lance Corporal and just letting out a... I just feel like that when he yeah. pops up on the screen, I just pictured a dark room at the ton of those from Drunk Marines just popping up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you guys say that in the Army cons where you just say kill every now and then? Like that's kill. a response. Like it's a affirmative. Like, hey, you guys tracking? Kill. Did you say that? <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, we yeah. always say Ki- kill. Yeah, yeah kill is kind of like, a, yeah, just yes. an all-encompassing mm-hmm. word. Um, hey, we guys, you guys tracking? Kill. Kill. Then there was women in this one. Remember last year there was no women in the birthday ball oh, message. Yeah. They tossed a couple ladies in there this year. I was glad to see. There we go. Um, they had a whole big cameo by Colonel Nicole Mann. Um, she flew, what, over 47 combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan in F-18s, and she's heading to space. So she's a fucking NASA commander now. So I thought that was fucking awesome. And she Anti-F-18 talked about... F-18 pilot. She was talking about, like, yeah, there was times I was fucking scared, and that's the moments where you have to get it together and hone that fear into just pure badassery, which I thought was really cool. Courage is not the absence of fear, but moving forward despite fear. Yep. There was some allusions to China and Russia, Ah, just straight up videos of them being like, we got to stay ready because these motherfuckers are getting squirrely. Um, And then they let us know right now there's over 31,000 Marines stationed overseas or deployed abroad. Kyle Carpenter was in the video. It's a great video. Um, So shout out to those 31,000 Marines. If you're listening right now and you're deployed somewhere, and my voice just crying here in a blade somewhere. I thought you were um, going to cry. <laughs> happy bir- no, just fucking happy birthday, Marines. <laughs> yeah. Just happy birthday, that's all. Um, and finally, um, next week interviewing uh, some reporters from military.com. Really interesting article they just came out with. Because um, the rise in military suicide, it was considered this mystery. Um, military.com did a ton of research, really dug deep, and traumatic brain injury is more and more looking like the the cause of these things and i think it's really important for veterans who are like what's wrong with me what's happening like it's such a relief sometimes when you find out like what is wrong like what's going on with you like there's an actual name for it wait a minute there's reasons this is happening and so they did a pretty interesting article about it i'm going to talk to those reporters next week so stay tuned for that that's it for me sorry what about you guys thank you i was waiting i was sitting here waiting Mm mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Yes. Great modeling, by the way, cons. Yes, very handsome. 
Yeah, dude. A lot of haters. Like, James Taylor fucking sucks. It's boring. I was like, dude, he has the velvety voice. He's an unbelievable acoustic guitar player. Had Carol King live at the Troubadour, and people were shitting on it. I nearly deleted my Instagram account. I'm like, if this is what people want, I don't want to be involved with this website anymore. Dude, mm -hmm. I asked a fucking uh, Genesis, too. What's James Taylor's voice is just smooth as Amazing. butter on yeah. velvet. Mm -hmm. Might listen to it again cruder. whenever we get done here. True. That's the second week in a row you've been old man yelling at <laughs> the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> these damn kids with their mumble rap. They have their mumble rap, these kids. All the, uh, you could have be listening to James Taylor. No, but you got your young thug. Uh. These kids are taking leave, going to weddings with their headsets on, listening to rap music. In my day, we had Crosby, Stills, and Nash, not Olivia <laughs> Rodrigo. <laughs> Oh, um, I don't really have a whole lot. Um, I'm excited to come up and hang out with you guys for our Marine Corps birthday that's actually tomorrow. I'll We're going to drink so many Dr. Peppers. <laughs> I must have drank me about 14 Dr. Peppers on the bus down to Philadelphia. <laughs> so I can't wait to do that. We have some other things going on yeah. next week. Uh, we appreciate you guys. All the veterans that are listening, happy Veterans Day. All the Marines that are listening, happy birthday. We appreciate you guys. Without you, we aren't here either. Um, I just mean the show. We probably would have been fine without that. <laughs> but uh, sound the retreat.